Hi everyone, Doug Adams, I'm a PT, and my goal is to get everyone analyzing gait. So what I wanna to do today is just talk about a way to simplify gait analysis a bit. One of the things that I see is people are often hesitant to get somebody on the treadmill because they see so much going on and they're not really sure where to start. So when you see this runner that's going and you're like, wow, what's, what are they doing with their arms and what's going on with their legs? There's a way to simplify it because I view gait analysis the same as having like a goniometer in your clinic. You need to be analyzing gait. Any athlete, any person that's walking, running, you need to be looking at their gait. So I wanna share how we at Rendy and A have um, really helped to simplify running gait and turn it into something that's really approachable as an essential for all clinicians working with any athlete there. So I'm a giant running nerd myself, and that's why I'm here to teach you about this stuff today and, and kind of introduce some of these things. Um, I started at University of Delaware, had great mentorship under Irene Davis and Rich Willie, and then continued to teach and develop technology and work on ways. And we have our courses, our certified running gate analyst courses, but now I work a lot with professional runners, uh, the military, and I have my own PT clinic in Wilmington that we help just endurance athletes. Uh, and some of you from AOPT might recognize that I was part of uh, some of the monograph working with the injured runner uh, as well. So that's kind of my background and why I'm here just to talk about all things running. Um, and when I talk about running, what I like to really first acknowledge is that running is this magic pill that if you took all the benefits of running and put it into pill form, it would be a sol uh, you know, solution for almost everything there. It increases everything we want and decreases everything we don't want. The problem with that is that it would never get approved by the FDA because 80% of runners get injured every year. So there would be a huge warning label on that running pill that everyone would say, do I really want to do this and start getting some hip pain or some foot pain or some knee pain? And that's what we, that's where we come in. That's where we can really make a huge difference with this. And to do that, we need to first really understand why these running injuries happen. So I'm not a big wordy slide person here, but this is one that I think is a great quote. And this was from a Bertelsen article in 2017, and it talked about really why running injuries happen. I think they did a great job verbalizing it, saying that we hypothesized the injury occur occurred as a result of the runner possessing multiple risk factors and then participating in running under certain circumstances to a degree where the structure's load capacity was exceeded. Little bit of a mouthful, but really great. And what that means is a basic level is that somebody ran and exceeded their body's capacity. And a little bit had to do with what they had done leading up to that run. And a lot of it had to do with what they were doing during the run, but something broke down and that's why they got injured. Now the trick with that, and I love this, is the trick is each person is unique. And what that definition from the Bertelsen article is, and what we really teach at Run DNA is that each runner has their own unique profile. Are you ready to revolutionize the way you treat the running athlete? Dive into the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapies, The Running Athlete, Prevention and Intervention Strategies. This comprehensive six monograph set, enriched with media and interactive ancillaries, equips clinicians with the essential skills to elevate the care of injured runners. With a focus on biomechanics, the runner's psyche, training principles, and footwear, this course prepares you to guide runners back to their passion quickly and safely. Find out more about this 30 contact hour resource at orthopt.org. And that running injuries are very multifactorial. And that's both good and bad for us as the clinicians. What's great about it is that you can make a change in one area and often see a lot of increased capacity. So the ability to participate in running just by making a small change there. So you don't have to make somebody have perfect running form or perfect movement or be extremely strong. You need to get them to improve certain areas of this injury profile so that they're able to make a significant gain in where they can participate in running. And that's what is really fun about working with runners and why I love to do it because there's always something to learn and there's always something we can do to help a runner achieve their level of success that they're shooting for. 
So the real solution to these running injuries is taking a movement-based treatment approach here, and we can analyze and simplify some of these concepts that we see and take some of what we're seeing with their form, their movement, and giving them an individualized plan based on what they need and what's going to get them the most benefit. So what we've done is we've really looked at how we can analyze this and break it down and make it simple so that we can provide quick results and then we can break it down further based on our time and our, our own unique experience working with runners. But we basically look at the runner at the center and we look at different movement things like a runner readiness assessment is looking at mobility, motor control, or loading levels, it's looking at their ability to jump and absorb and generate force. We look at their running form, we look at their strength, and then we consider all those patient specific things too. And those are really helpful for clinicians to be able to say, where do I start? What do I really focus on so that we're delivering value on day one? And if you're not under, if you don't understand some of the basics of running, we do have a free course for that. If you want to learn more about running biomechanics and you want to get a little bit more in depth about myology and understanding that, I highly encourage you because it is important to understand those basics, but not something we need to jump into today. What I do want to jump into is the categorization. Because if we go back to what we started at the beginning of this, when we said that it can be intimidating to actually have somebody get on the treadmill and you start looking and say, well, their knees are coming together and they're landing too far in front of their body and their arms are crossing over and it looks like they're upright. That gets to be intimidating. Where do you start? And a lot of times when you find the right cue, when you find the right thing that you want to address, that's where we really see you get these unintended benefits that some of the things clean up. So we introduced based off of a lot of when we were doing some research out of the University of Delaware, started noticing patterns where all of a sudden, maybe there wasn't a perfect form, but there were some things people were doing. And when we went to the literature and saw what these commonalities were, we started to see that there are some distinct patterns that people have that contribute to injury. So these five categories that we talk about are either our overstrider, our collapser, our weaver, our bouncer, and our glute amnesiac. And we're gonna give a little example of each of these through a video um, and talk a little bit about what that means at each here. So we're gonna go into the first one here and we're gonna go into the collapser. And what the collapser is, we're gonna see that that collapser is somebody that is um, losing the frontal plane battle uh, as well as a bit of the transverse. So this is the run that you see running down the road and their knees are knocking. They've got a lot of motion going on. I call this the ponytail sign a lot of times. You'll see their ponytail whipping back and forth. If For those of you, if you're listening to this, I'm bald and this one doesn't really work for me here. Uh, but what we see is that really uh, a lot of motion in the frontal and transverse plane. And that's something that is characteristic and you'll definitely uh, understand this when you see this type of runner. The next one that we see is this weaver. And this is person who, and I'm really overselling this on the, the video demonstration here. This is somebody that is landing across the midline at initial contact, they're crossing over. And the benefit of this to the runner is that it reduces some of the demands for dynamic stability because their foot is closer underneath of their center of mass. So they don't have to control as much side to side motion doing it this way. But you can imagine a runner that is going along and has IT band issues, and you see that they have these weaving type mechanics, how much that's gonna put stress on the lateral aspect of the thigh. So we really wanna look and see who is this weaver runner. The next runner is gonna be our bouncer. And this isn't too hard for me to really uh, play because I do a good bit of this as well. But this is somebody that has excessive vertical oscillation. So they're spending more time going up and down than they should, as opposed to putting more of their force in going forward. And this is a physics problem where what goes up must come down. We're going to see higher forces on this runner because they're spending a lot of the time going up and down and it's not as efficient and it can put some increased stress on the body. The next thing that we're going to look at is the glute amnesiac. And this glute amnesiac is another good example. And I've got a good story about this one that I like to share that this is somebody who is landing 
in an, almost an extended posture where they're either very upright or leaning backwards. And when we run, we naturally should fall forward and start a little upright, but then we continue to fall forward. But what we see here, this person is kind of staying backwards. And the advantage to the runner in this situation is that they are shifting the moment arm or the amount of rotation from the center of rotation there where they're reducing the demand on the glutes and but they're sacrificing the anterior chain so the posterior side of the body the back half doesn't have to do as much work because they're already vertical and they don't have to pose gravity pulling us forward but then the front is really having a lot of issues and the story i like to share about this glute amnesiac is where i had this really wealthy individual come in one day and he wanted to book two days of my time because he was getting ready for a marathon and couldn't get running past five miles six miles without having knee pain so he comes in we do a bunch of analysis we did our runner readiness we did these things i put him on the treadmill and he's just clearly a glute amnesiac so i say hey try something try leaning forward he's like wow that feels a lot better so he ran and he ran the first day and he got to the five mile point and he's like, no pain. He's like, okay, I'm gonna come back and try it again tomorrow and, and see if this was just a fluke. Comes back the next day, no pain. And he says, he gets in his private plane and heads home and it's like, yeah, you got the rest of the day off. But this is an example of when you find the right cue, when you find what really is making the biggest difference for somebody, you can be a hero to that person because a small change can make a big influence on their ability to participate in running. Now, the last one is probably the most common one that we see. And this is one where we're gonna see overstriding. This is characterized by somebody landing far in front of their body. And they're really just elongating that uh, step length out. And we don't want to take these big long steps. We want them to cover distance with stride, um, but we don't want them taking a large step in order to achieve a higher stride length there. And let's look at this one a little bit more in depth. And this is kind of what we do in the courses. And we're giving you a much abbreviated version here, but we look at it and we kind of go in here and we use 3D, but this can be used with the visual 2D, uh, any technique here. Um, but what we're identifying are some of the metrics that really contribute to this overstriding mechanics. And what we see here in this position is that person is landing very far with their foot out in front of their center of mass. And that causes almost a breaking instance when their foot is hitting the ground. So if we look at it here in a freeze frame, what I like to identify and the easiest way to identify this, if you're hopefully you're going to start looking at more people running, just look at their position when their foot hits the ground. And if you draw a line straight up from their ankle, from the lateral malleolus, and you go vertical in that position, if that line is in front of their knee, there's some overstriding tendencies. There, this is a simplification of it. And that's from a Salza article in 2016. And I think that that's a really great way to look at it. Um, that's the simplest way. If you're just doing some 2D, you're looking at it, just draw that line and see where they're at. Now there's other things that we look at too. We're looking at the angle of their shin. We're looking at the angle of their foot. And uh, when we're using 3D, we're looking at their strike from center of mass and measuring how far they are in front of their body. But what all this is doing is it's causing a breaking force that when the foot hits the ground, they're slowing down between each step. And we can not essentially eliminate all of that, but what we can is reduce it because this puts a lot of stress on the body and has been linked to uh, certain injuries there. So once we identify these categories here, then we want to see, well, what do we do about it, right? Because looking at it is one thing, but changing it is another thing. And what we do in the courses is teach everyone how to have specific gate cues. And in our level two course, we actually go through 12 categories instead of the five, because each category has a specific cue that you use in order to improve your running. But remember, when you're retraining somebody's form, it's going to be hard at first but it gets better over time. And what the research has shown is that when you first do something, you engage every muscle in your body because you're trying to change this form. And you may have become efficient at the way that you run, but it's not the most efficient way that you can run. What we want to show people is that they can improve their form and that there is a benefit for that. But remember, you're not trying to make anybody a perfect runner. There's a Stuart Warden article, I believe it's 2021, that looked at managing bone stress injuries. And they showed in that article that if you can reduce the stress of each step by 10%, 
somebody can run twice as far before the body breaks down. This means, this is great news for us as clinicians because we don't have to turn somebody into a perfect runner. And the idea is not to mimic elite or professional runners here. The idea is to just give them a little benefit so that they can participate more here. And we can't do this, and this is one of the things I most commonly see, strengthening can't alter movement patterns. So if we look back at that collapser where their knee's coming in, somebody might suggest that that person has weak glutes and they're, they're not able to control that. But you can't just strengthen their glutes and expect them to change their movement pattern because it actually activates different areas of the motor cortex than skill training does. And strength training is very different from that perspective. And this is well supported in the literature here. I think Rich Willie and Irene Davis did a great job here of just showing a program where they had 20 females with the excessive peak hip adduction. They did a bunch of hip strengthening. And what we saw is that there was no change in the mechanics with this, that there was no real difference in the amount of hip adduction that they were going to, even though they increased their strength. What we need to do is we need to do gait retraining with them and we need to do skill training. If you're not familiar with motor learning, um, those principles are really important. How we train somebody, um, that's something we go a lot of detail, a little bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, but really important that you understand that you make a gradual change and you use proper motor learning technique and support that with drills. I'm a huge fan of doing drills. We'll show you a video of this marching drill that I really like. Um, just the challenge of working with runners is that running is actually a very highly skilled movement and it's harder to learn than some other activities. Take golf, for example. When you hit a golf ball, you hit a golf ball and you get immediate feedback about how you're doing. When you're running, you have no feedback about what you're doing. So drills like this, where we can slow down the phases of running gait, are really beneficial because they the runner gets an idea of what's happening at their body and you can give them feedback about it. So I really like doing drills like this, uh, this marching drill, we do wall drills, and those are really beneficial with that. So hopefully just this gives you some quick ideas about when you're looking at a runner, when you're getting somebody up on the treadmill or watching them run outside, Try to just think about what's the most important thing and think about those categories and maybe where to start and see if it has a difference. Because one that's gonna give your patient a better understanding, they're not gonna think, oh, maybe I'm not built for this running thing. But two, it gives you a clear pathway of what you should focus on and see if that makes a difference in their participation. When you find the right thing, the runner's really gonna be able to tell and feel that difference. And that's the real goal because that is allowing them to participate further in what they're doing. So appreciate you uh, taking a quick second just to hear a little bit more about running gait and why we should really simplify some of these gait impairments that we see. And using a category approach is a great way to communicate with your patients and also design a plan that's going to make a big difference in their ability to participate. So hopefully everyone is now going to start putting all their patients on the treadmill and start looking. Um, if you'd like to find more, uh, check us out at rundna.com and you'll be able to see more uh, about the courses and what we do and how we utilize these techniques and technology to get great results with runners. Thanks very much for your time.